Good morning. Welcome, everybody. It's good to see everybody this Wednesday morning. Um, I'm Mark Lawrence from Worldwide Land Transfer and Worldwide Education, and we welcome you here to our continuing education classes for real estate agents. Uh, we also on this platform give continually led for lawyers, but today's class is a one credit class for continuing education, uh, one CE credit. So if you were here for that, you're in the right place. By signing in, you've essentially signed the sign-in sheet. Remember when we used to sign those things? Um, and you'll need uh, to stay here to the end, which is 12 o'clock. And uh, during that time, answer one attendance question, which will pop up as a poll uh, during the class. Um, and if you answer that, and then at the end, we will uh, email you a form. You just have to send that back and you will get your one credit, which uh, we'll email to you within about three weeks. If you have a license renewal coming up or need it uh, sooner than that, then please reach out uh, to my colleague, Michelle Wu, who's here as well. In the box, it says WWEDU. It's Michelle who coordinates all these classes uh, with me. Um, as I said, I'm Mark Lawrence from Worldwide Land Transfer, which is a real estate title insurance company. So if you have questions about real estate transactions, please reach out. Uh, to me and I'd be happy to help you if I can. Um, so today's class, uh, as uh, you all know, is about finding hidden, hidden assets. Um, obviously, uh, it was something of interest, which is why you signed up and it should be interesting. It's the first time we're giving this class and I'm excited to hear it uh, myself. Um, the uh, speakers today, who I'll introduce in a second, they uh, do uh, encourage, uh, if you have any questions down at the bottom of your screen is a QA and a tab. You could type those questions in there and I'll monitor that if it's applicable to what they're talking about at the time. I'll uh, pose that question to them, or if not, we'll save the question to the end and, uh, and ask it then. And uh, there's also a chat icon. So if you have any uh, technical or administrative uh, issues you wanna bring up, or if you just wanna say hi, certainly you could use that chat uh, uh, tab to do that. So I think that's all the introductory, uh, messages that I have other than we have a lot of other classes. So please check that out at www.worldwidelandtransfer.com backslash events. Or if you're on our website, go to the WWEDU tab and uh, take a look and sign up. So let me introduce our speakers for today and let's uh, uh, start moving forward on this. So we have three speakers and um, they are experts in the area of matrimonial law and high net worth divorce cases and finding assets in connection with those cases, which is uh, what we're gonna hear about. So uh, today our speakers are Jackie Harunian, Joseph, I'm gonna mess up his name, uh, even though I practice it, um, Brackenier, uh, and uh, Lisa Mogil Mogilner from Omni Present Investigation. So uh, let's turn the program over to them. Hopefully I didn't mess up the names too bad and uh, let's get started. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you so much, Mark, and thank you, Michelle, for uh, organizing this program. And I'm really delighted at the turnout. Uh, and I know this program is gonna be available for sharing afterwards. And so hopefully we can increase the turnout. Uh, so my name is Jackie Harunian. I'm a partner at Whistleman Harunian and Associates in Great Neck. And this is a very interesting topic and a very relevant topic, probably more so than ever because of the pandemic, they actually announced today that New York courts are going to be shutting down again for non-essential uh, appearances. Although matrimonial and family law matters, housing matters are still gonna go forward, domestic violence matters, uh, but it's harder than ever really to have access to justice. Uh, and it's even easier than ever to hide assets and my associate, uh, Joe Brackenier, one of the attorneys in our firm is going to be presenting a lot of practice pointers for financial professionals so that they can really give special attention to clients that need it. And so um, high net worth cases are always a very interesting challenge for financial professionals, whether we're lawyers, accountants, uh, brokers, uh, or investigators. And uh, they present a very special challenge for attorneys in family law matters. We have a duty as attorneys to zealously advocate on behalf of our clients, and they are counting on us to help them get the best possible outcome with regard to their legal and financial rights. And whether we act as attorneys or some of us act also as mediators in cases, we have a, a duty to look for red flags in cases where there are assets or income that might be hidden. Uh, because in many instances, we are certifying information to the court. 
uh, and we cannot uh, suborn or facilitate perjury. Um, but I don't want to shock or alarm anyone. Uh, it's uh, sometimes our clients don't tell the truth. <laughs> and sometimes when they're being betrayed by a spouse and they're angry and upset, they're not always fair and they're not always reasonable. And sometimes they are less than honest. So we tend to be divorce attorneys and lots of financial professionals that work in this field. We tend to be a little cynical about the information that we're given. Uh, we've really seen a lot of very uh, unusual situations, sometimes shocking situations. And we have learned not to underestimate the other side. Uh, we're talking about the other party and their attorney. Uh, we have learned to bring in other financial professionals and investigators when needed, because as attorneys, obviously, we have our own limits to what we can really do for clients. And uh, we know how to manage expectations. The best matrimonial lawyers really need to manage their clients' expectations, really help them understand what they can expect in a case, what the limits of the court system are, no less during a pandemic. And we have to take special care with clients that are sort of behind the eight ball. That's a, that's a legal term. <laughs> and that means the client that is really in the dark about income and assets, the client that maybe is not really sitting at the table when it's a high net worth case, maybe doesn't have access to information, maybe didn't care so much while the times were good in the marriage. And now they're coming into a divorce situation really without, um, the necessary access to information about business or uh, the business or certain assets of the marriage that are a little bit more challenging to really pin down um, inventory and appraise. And I'm gonna get into a little bit of that. Um, I just wanna say a little bit, a bit about our firm, um, brag a little bit about our firm. We do have nine attorneys and mediators. We have an amazing litigation team, including Joe Brackenier, who you're gonna hear from. Uh, and we are recognized as the top tier firm by US News and World Reports and a lot of other industry awards. And it's because we, we can protect clients when we're talking about litigation. Uh, and, and it's necessary to do that. You have to be willing to go to court and take an abres aggressive approach with respect to some of these situations because you just can't take your client's word for it. You can't take the other side's word for it. And we have an obligation to protect the client. I also wanna say that although we have a high volume firm with nine attorneys here, our cases run the gamut from very simple ones with clients with very modest means all the way to high net worth, multi-million dollar matters. Um, and you'd be surprised to know that hidden assets don't just happen on the high end. Sometimes it happens when, when parties have very modest means. It really has to do with the psychology of the client, their spouse, sometimes the psychology of the other attorney and how motivated people are to be less than honest and to hide income. And a lot of times how premeditated this case uh, has been for how many months or years where one party has been motivated to hide assets. Sometimes in the high net worth uh, clients, you have more, uh, more of a trust factor and parties know what's going on. They are familiar with their tax returns. They know where the assets and accounts are. Uh, and, and sometimes the exact opposite is true when there's less, uh, fewer zeros uh, in, in the bank balance and, and fewer dollar signs in the case. So it, it really has to do with uh, how inclined the parties are to hide assets, how much level of trust there is between the parties and how much access both parties have to information regarding their assets and debts. So, um, one of the side effects of the pandemic is that it can be harder to track down and untangle assets during a divorce. Because as I mentioned, there's less access to the courts. We have to employ different strategies. There are a lot of cases now where parties have reversals in income, uh, reversals in what's going on with their businesses, uh, coupled with a breakdown in communication between the parties. Um, we have uh, sometimes strategic foreclosures going on, strategic bankruptcies, parties that are suddenly taking on a lot of debt or a lot of business debt. Of course, sometimes it's legit and sometimes it isn't. And, and that is part of the strategy that we employ when we sit down with clients to find out what types of, uh, what the situation is that we're dealing with. And so what, when I'm referring to uh, hidden assets, 
or, or more complex assets, I'm gonna go into some of the screening we do, some of the uh, issue spotting and fact spotting that we're doing in a case. So we're talking about cash income, businesses with cash income or parties that are not reporting their income. Joey is, Joe is gonna go into specifically how we deal with that uh, in, in the case in court. How do we deal with a mismatch between what's on the tax returns and the lifestyle of the parties? Um, we're talking about uh, LLCs, partnerships, businesses that one party is controlling as a shareholder or maybe unknown entities, LLCs, businesses, uh, uh, S-Corps, things like that. I'm talking about stock options, bonuses, uh, restricted stock, um, stock that is vested or is not, uh, not vested, bonuses that are either incentive bonuses or performance bonuses. There's a very big difference between how those are treated in matrimonial matters. Some, of, some bonuses are based on past performance and others are based on retention and keeping an employee with a business. And so the filing of a divorce action can actually really have an impact on how much of that bonus is shared as marital property. Uh, we've dealt with cases where there's wire transfers, assets that are transferred out of the country or offshore, um, cash advances, even purchasing gift, gift cards or taking out money from an ATM month after month, year after year, and suddenly one of the parties realizes that money is missing. Uh, sometimes it's really taking a look, as I mentioned, at debt, home equity lines of credit. Uh, the parties take out money from a line of credit or refinance a mortgage and take out cash. And suddenly uh, when the divorce happens, uh, one of the parties is wondering where that money went. Uh, you know, who paid for the contractors? What were the home renovations? And if you wait too long to investigate those types of claims, uh, the courts can lose interest because the judge will say, well, that happened years ago. It's too late to challenge it now. Not to say it can't be done. It just becomes more of a challenge. Um, Jewelry and, and gold and, and you know, boats and cars, these types of more tangible personal property assets can be very tricky to deal with in divorce. Uh, we've had several cases with Indian families where there's Indian gold jewelry during um, a wedding ceremony that suddenly goes missing. There are certain strategies to deal with safe deposit boxes because sometimes parties both have access to a safe deposit box where there's cash or gold coins, or like I mentioned, jewelry, and then it goes missing. Uh, believe it or not, there are certain emergency applications we can make to the court. Uh, we've had uh, several over the years regarding restraining safe deposit boxes before the spouse can run over and empty the, the account uh, or empty the box. And that requires a court order it requires engaging a personnel of the bank so that there can be a viewing of what's in the safe deposit box with both parties present. Um, we had a case quite recently where we uh, used an investigator. And by the way, we've used Lisa's firm also, and she's terrific. And um, I, I enjoy working with investigators where warranted because sometimes it really prevents uh, what's called marital waste, suddenly missing assets. Uh, we had a case where our, our client believed that all of the essential documents relating to her husband's very substantial real estate business, many millions of dollars, um, dozens of LLCs, she believed that all those records were in her husband's mother's basement. And believe it or not, we got a court order on an emergency basis as a complete surprise to go appear at the basement with witnesses to take photographs and inventory the documents that were in the basement. Uh, this really happened. It was very necessary to do. And ultimately our client believed that without having those records, it would uh, undermine and prejudice her case. So these are the kinds of things that I'm talking about, utilizing litigation and court techniques in order to protect uh, hidden assets or hidden information. Uh, Believe it or not, sometimes tools, things in the garage, <laughs> things that are very valuable, sometimes need to be inventoried in a case. And it, depending on the party's uh, lifestyle, their business, uh, other assets that they have, uh, whether it's cars, tractors, ATVs on upstate properties, these are all things that need to be inventoried. Uh, we had a case with a wine collection that was very, very valuable. Uh, we have to um, find out from the client 
how much money we're talking about and whether it's worth pursuing these types of assets. And we can get the help of the court to either appoint receivers or find a way to protect and preserve those assets. Uh, another type of asset that I wanted to talk about that is exceedingly important is uh, intellectual property. And intellectual property is a type of hidden asset that's sort of hidden in plain sight. What if you are dealing with um, a case where there's um, you know, technology, an app that's being created during the marriage, uh, something that's trademarked or patented or not yet trademarked or patented. These are the types of assets that are very challenging, are hidden in plain sight, and you need uh, a matrimonial attorney or experts involved to value them um, in a very proactive and strategic way to protect the client. Uh, I don't wanna go over my time, uh, I just want to very, uh, in a minute or two that I have left, speak very briefly about an update uh, in family law, which is in your outline, in which I was uh, going to present as part of my presentation. I could obviously spend a lot of time talking about all of the new changes in family law, but over the past 10 years, in addition to the fact that spousal support is no longer tax deductible since the law was changed in 2017, we have almost consistently across the board no fault divorce, which means no negative grounds in the vast majority of cases. We have a starting point of joint custody for parents uh, on a gender neutral basis. Again, very consistent across the board, unless we're talking about extreme cases, you're gonna have joint custody agreements. We have gender neutral spousal support, child support. So now we have women breadwinners that have to pay spousal support. They don't really love that, but that's the way the law is written now. We have more uh, defined laws regarding spousal support guidelines uh, and payment of counsel fees by the moneyed spouse. Uh, and the last uh, major change over the past 10 years is that licenses and degrees are no longer marital property in New York State. So those used to be a type of complex asset that we had to investigate and, and seek to have equitably distributed. And now those are off the table although businesses are still marital property if they grow in value during a marriage um, and separate property having to do with commingled assets uh, either inherited or prior to the marriage are still uh, very much a factor in contested divorce matters. So um, I am going to uh, try to answer some of the questions in the chat a little bit later on uh, if there are any, but now I'm gonna turn things over to our associate, Joseph Brackenier, uh, and he will follow up on some of the things that I talked about and talked about talk about litigation strategy. Hi, good morning. Uh, my name is Joseph Brackenier. I'm one of the associates at Whistleman Heronian Associates. Uh, I work with Jackie. Uh, I'm just gonna be picking up uh, kind of where she left off and just go over some more um, strategies and approaches and things we have when there are hidden assets involved in the case and there are uh, things that need to be discovered. Um, one of the, at the onset of a case, something Jackie had touched base on is that both parties in a divorce are required to fill out what's called the statement of net worth. Uh, the statement of net worth is going to detail all the uh, expenses and, and assets that each of the parties has. Um, they're meant to list every single asset. Uh, there's nothing to be, there's no exceptions to be put on there. Um, so everything is to be dis disclosed at the onset of the case. So that will kind of give us a starting point and a launching point for beginning our investigation. Um, oftentimes clients will know um, and they'll say, you know, he has something in addition to that. She has additional accounts in that. That's not all that's listed. Um, so one of the you know, most basic things that we have at our disposal is, is, a, is a subpoena, uh, where we're able to send out subpoenas on behalf of our clients to different banks, um, uh, real estate companies and organizations to have them turn over the bank accounts, statements, records, and things like that. Um, so we're able to basically send those out um, to anyone we believe would have uh, an account there. Um, so obviously the easiest thing to do is send it out under that individual's name um, to any and all banks to get any statements that they may or may not have. Uh, so oftentimes that's something that's very quick. Um, we're able to get those out, an account that wasn't listed on the statement of net worth, whether it's at Chase Bank, Capital One, a local branch of anything, 
um, and it'll turn out that that person has a safety deposit box there that wasn't listed on the statement of net worth. Um, so obviously right there, that would be something that's uncovered. That was a hidden asset that gets uncovered uh, relatively quickly. Um, there are also penalties that go along with hiding that asset. Um, so something that we have to instruct all of our clients immediately is when we're talking about um, a divorce and we're talking about what's called equitable distribution of the assets, that doesn't necessarily mean equal distribution of the assets. So one of the things that will happen um, is that if somebody is hiding something and somebody's going to great lengths to make sure something that isn't discovered, um, they don't list it on their statement, statement of net worth. During depositions, they deny its existence. Um, and somebody has to jump through a lot of hoops uh, to prove that it exists. Uh, when the court goes and they deal with that asset and other assets that are involved with it, and we bring it to the court's attention, um, again, it's not equal distribution. So if they're hiding something, um, one of the things that the court might say is, well, you know, you went through all the, uh, all the hurdles of trying to make sure that this wasn't discovered. So instead of this asset being split 50-50, we're going to split this asset 80-20, 70-30, or you're not getting any of it because you were trying to hide it. Everything that was in that safety deposit box is now going to go to the other party because it's equitable distribution, not equal. And this is a punishment for attempting to hide things like this. Um, so that's something that we explain to all of our clients that come in, that the penalty for hiding an asset um, is not just, oh, well, they found it, now we're going to split it 50-50, and that's all there is to it. Um, you can get uh, penalized for doing that and for hiding these assets. Um, so in addition, you know, that first subpoena might not uncover something immediately like that that says that there's something hidden. So obviously, we have to dive deeper. Um, obviously, when that happens, we get a copy of those bank statements, we get a copy of those credit card statements, and we need to start reviewing them and going through them thoroughly. Oftentimes, what you'll discover is that uh, on, a, on a bank statement, um, there'll be deposits coming from an unknown account. And you'll see wires coming in, wires going out to an unknown account. Um, that account might be in a different name. It might be in a business name. But obviously, when you start seeing those things, if we can attach it to that account, we could send out additional subpoenas to see what that account is. Um, we have uh, depositions, uh, examinations before trial where we're able to sit down and question the other party about each and every one of those transactions and let them explain what happened. So if there is a monthly deposit of $5,000 from some sort of other account and they're saying they have no other sources of income, they're gonna to need to be able to explain where that $5,000 is and where is it's coming from. Could be 5,000, could be 50,000, whatever it is. Um, we're gonna be able to question them. And then if they have an answer, send out follow-up subpoenas based on that or ask them to turn over the additional documents that go on that. Same thing with cash withdrawals. If somebody's going to an ATM every month and they're taking out thousands of dollars in cash, they're need, you know, going to need to be able to be able to explain what they're doing with that cash and where it's going or what's happening with it. Um, an example of this, um, and as it ties into to real estate, um, oftentimes someone will have real estate properties, rental income um, that'll be coming in and they'll claim that they have no interest in the property. Uh, I, had an, I had a case like that where uh, the husband and wife were separating and the wife had said, you know, he owns, I believe it was eight different rental properties in Queens. He claimed on his statement of net worth, they're all of his, they're all his brothers. He has no interest. He has nothing in them whatsoever. Um, during the depositions, it turns out, uh, we discovered an additional bank account. When we subpoenaed that bank account, we found that the tenants of all those properties were writing their rent checks personally to him. They weren't writing them to the LLC. They were writing it out to him as an individual, and he was claiming he had nothing to do with the business, but he was getting $60,000 a month in rent where tenants were writing checks to him, and they were being deposited into an account that he had that he didn't disclose. Um, of course, his claim at that time was that that he was just doing that for convenience to help out his brother who lived in Florida, um, but that didn't hold water because in that account, he was paying for personal expenses of his own, including the fact that the marital property's mortgage was being automatically withdrawn from that account every month. Um, so if he has no ownership interest in that property, but he's collecting $60,000 a month in rent and it's paying their personal bills, um, obviously, um, that was marital property. It was something he was attempting to hide. 
And not only was it for income purposes for calculating child support and maintenance, we were then able to argue that she was a part owner of those properties, which were each valued at several million, several million dollars each, and she was entitled to a portion of that through equitable distribution. Um, as far as uh, recent developments and things that have been happening recently with the pandemic, uh, one of the things that we've been coming across and we're just starting to deal with now is the fact that there are situations ongoing, uh, particularly with business owners where they're claiming um, a downturn in business during the pandemic. Um, they're out of work altogether. Um, and one of the things that we've been able to look into is that people that are claiming that they're unable to work, uh, we've been able to have private investigators such as Lisa and other ones, they're able to pull up information on these payroll loans that have been going out. And if the companies are applying for them, and oftentimes the information that they're putting in these applications, uh, claiming what their payroll is, claiming what their expenses are, and, and why they need this loan, and they're receiving a loan for hundreds of thousands of dollars um, to cover payroll, to cover their own expenses, um, and then they're claiming to the court that they're out of work and they have no income. Um, so obviously, uh, when, well, they'll be able to show something that shows that they are out of work, um, but it won't line up with what other documents that they're submitting for their uh, payroll applications. Um, so that's been a recent development uh, as a result of the pandemic. Uh, also, people that are claiming that they're not going to work because of these times, we're able to hire private investigators and follow them um, to determine if they are going to the office. Um, we've had some success with getting um, uh, subpoenas out to the internet uh, service providers um, to show if there is an IP uh, issue where somebody is claiming they're not working, but they're ro logging in remotely to their office or to their desk. So maybe they're not leaving the house. They're claiming they're not at work, but we're able to show that they are logging in remotely to their workplace on a daily or weekly basis when they're claiming that they're not working. Um, so again, this is a recent developments where people are claiming that they don't have assets or their income has dropped um, due to the pandemic, and they're using it as an excuse to say, here's why I can't make my obligations and I can't make these payments. But uh, obviously, if they are working, um, they might have to make a claim as I literally just gotten a response yesterday of, yes, I said I was not working, um, but I am working for free. I'm going to my office. I'm working for my employer. I'm, I'm there three, two days a week physically and three days a week logging in remotely, but I haven't been paid a dime. Um, when the, the company was still paying for their corporate credit cards, for their corporate expenses. Um, they were directing their company and their accountant at the company to make payments on behalf of their spouse's car. Um, but the claim is they have no income and they are laid off. But obviously when we did the search, it turns out that that is absolutely false. Um, in addition to uh, the, the pandemic issues, an additional way of people that uh, hide assets in plain sight is by going through personal and business tax returns and going through the different schedules that are attached therein. Uh, somebody might be claiming that their, uh, that their income is only $100,000 or $200,000 on a business income that's five, six, seven hundred thousand. And when you go through what the expense sections are, a lot of time they're deducting or claiming as business expenses, personal and marital expenses. They might have their business uh, rent uh, an office in the marital residence for six or $7,000 a month. Um, and they're claiming that as a business deduction um, when it's not, uh, it's, it, they're paying their own mortgage but claiming the business is based there and lowering their income accordingly. Um, addition, their car costs, um, business travel, travel expenses, they might be claiming you know, their, their household bills and their food and dining expenses with the family are being deducted as business expenses. So you know, their claim is, no, I, I, I gave you my tax return. My tax return shows my income is 200. Um, and their argument will be is that both spouses, if they're filing married um, as husband and wife, both parties are bound to that. Um, that's what the case law holds, is that you can't make an argument for additional income uh, if you're claiming that you can't hold it out for tax purposes that the, the marital income was 200,000 and then claim to the court it was really 500,000 um, because of this. Um, but even when that's in place, if you're able to look at those tax returns and you see that marital expenses, family expenses were being paid through the business, 
that money can be reattributed as income for purposes of calculating um, support, child support and maintenance. Um, so there, there are different ways that uh, when these things are being hidden, even in plain sight, that they're able to be shown to the court and um, have them imputed as income and have them imputed as property that needs to be distributed through the marriage. Um, one of the, the toughest things that we have to deal with are uh, situations where um, you're, you're dealing with cash heavy businesses where there's not going to be any sort of statements at all that attach to it. Um, as I had said, just in the real estate industry, um, there's a lot of tenants that pay in cash. Um, they'll be paying their rent monthly in cash or they'll be paying part cash, part money order. Um, so when you go through and you see bank statements and you, you see statements like that, there might not be anything to show on it. Um, but one of the things that we look to do in situations like that is we will look to get the records of the business. Um, so it might not just be limited to bank statements. If we're seeing that, um, for example, in a, in a real estate situation, if we're looking through and we're able to get copies of, of the leases, and the leases are going to show lease amounts for you know twenty five hundred dollars a month in rent, but there's no corresponding uh, deposits to that amount. Um, obviously, the argument will then be made that the cat it's coming in in cash or it's coming in, in money orders and it's not being deposited. Um, and then we would have to look to make you know that's something that will become a difficult case to prove. But at the same time, if we're able to show that uh, there are eviction actions and they evict other tenants for non-payment. Um, the argument could be made either that they are intentionally not receiving rent or what the market value is of that property and it's been a mismanagement of funds and as such that money should be reincorporated in and calculated as income or it should be wherever that cash amount would be over the time um, should be subject to equitable distribution where that party is entitled to their marital portion of whatever would be there um, and that's just as it relates to you know the real estate assets um, same thing with getting information on if the business is being held by an LLC, um, looking through the profit loss statements of anything that might be held where they're saying that there was major, maybe a major capital improvement or putting down uh, depreciation values on items to lessen the value of that um, and give an offset of some sort of tax credit to be able to show that the building's operating at a net loss when really it's some sort of carryover. Um, from years past, and there actually is current uh, cash flow and current income that should be uh, considered for terms of equitable distribution and or child support and spousal support. Um, because just because you're carrying over a loss year to year doesn't mean there's income uh, that isn't coming in and that you're not going to have to pay child support based on that. Um, so you really need to go through these things and we need to go through these things um, in a very detailed way. Um, and when you're going through a lot of these profit and loss statements, um, you can't just look at them, you know, just on the surface. Sometimes what we have to ask for is the notes that go through with them, because a lot of times something is just attached as a footnote that says that there's a carryover. And so sometimes just on the, the printout document, it's not there. You might need the actual source where the footnotes are, because a lot of times people hide things in those sections. Um, so you really need to go through them very thoroughly to see what's there and to see if there's anything hidden um, that, that's within there. Um, that's basically, uh, you know, in a nutshell, without going into any more, you know, specific details, just some of the things that we're able to do to uncover some of these assets. Um, as I had said, a lot of times we rely on private investigators such as Lisa. Um, so I'm going to turn this over to her now so she can explain exactly what she does when she works with us or outside of uh, a divorce format, other things she offers. Actually, before we turn to Lisa, let's do our attendance question. Okay. So those of you that are here for the one credit, you have to check the circle that says the code 60212. So if you're here for your one credit CE, uh, then please click the circle that says 60212. Or if you're phoning in, I think one person is, or if you step away, then look in the chat box and send an email to Michelle Wu, MWU at www.landtransfer.com telling her that you were here, um, but you did not see the poll or you stepped away for a second uh, and that the code is 60212. So you need to answer that and then you'll need to uh, 
send back the form we're going to email you at the end or after the class and we will be able to get you your credits for this so uh please check 60212 and let's uh get ready to turn it over to lisa hi everybody i'm actually going to share my screen um Can everybody see my screen? Yes. Great. So my name is Lisa McGillner. I am a private investigator and co-owner of Omnipresent Investigations. So we are a licensed and insured private investigative agency in New York and South Florida. We have about 35 years of NYPD and investigative experience. So our services cover a whole wide range of things from like matrimonial and insurance related investigations, um, asset searches, background checks, locates, process serving, and basically any type of surveillance or fraud that can be detected, we look for. Um, so today we'll be covering the um, investigating cases that involve high conflict divorces. So what we as an investigator can find when conducting asset searches in regards to hidden assets, including real estate, safety deposit boxes, um, Bitcoin investments, and bank accounts. And also we'll talk about you know, what is legal and what is not legal um, for us as investigators to, to look for, um, because people think that we could just find out anything and everything. Um, so let's start. So in terms of uh, investigating cases, so nationwide um, asset searches look for banks, brokerage on um, property information, such as like cars, companies, real estate, hidden assets, money, planes, trust accounts, bank accounts, um, investments, offshore bank accounts, um, as well as any judgments and liens the person might have. Um, so that costs about $450. Um, when it comes to real estate, if it's in your name, it's always traceable. So when people try to hide stuff, they put it in someone else's name. And that's what Joseph and Jackie were saying, how they would have to subpoena and kind of do a lot of digging in order to find something that it's, that's not in your name or in your company name. Um, in terms of, uh, you know, safety deposit box, is a safety deposit box traceable? You can establish a classic safety deposit box with most banks, but it is written directly in your name or your company name. So whenever, especially in the case of like a distrator court order, it is very easily traceable and the institution has an obligation to make it available. Again, if your name's not on it, can't trace it unless they can find ways to connect you to that person, to that box and to adding money and uh, items in there. Um, in terms of Bitcoin, is Bitcoin traceable or safe to use? People think it's anonymous. So Bitcoin transactions, they're public, they're traceable, and they are permanently stored in the Bitcoin network. Anybody can see the balance and all the transactions of any addresses. Since users usually have to reveal their identity in order to receive services or goods, Bitcoin addresses cannot remain fully anonymous whatsoever. In terms of stock investments, are they traceable? So the US Securities and Exchange Commission, the SEC, they provide everything you need to research in order to research uh, US stocks. Um, they use a database, um, Edgar. So this is where you will find all stock information and um, who's investing, what's investing, and how much is investing. Um, in terms of bank accounts, open versus closed. So without a judgment or court order subpoena makes our job very hard. We are very limited to what information will be given to us or what we can obtain when it comes to financial specifically uh, without a judgment or order. So certain programs require that banks obtain and retain checking and savings accounts. So customer data, including like contact, identification and tax information. And the FDIC regulations mandate that banks must keep this information for five years after the account is closed. So within those five years, if somebody's looking, they, they will find that. 
So in terms of what is legal versus illegal, um, you know, like I said, people think investigating is like the movies where we can do anything and break any law, but there are many laws and regulations to limit what we can and cannot obtain and or do. Um, so for instance, New York, it's a no fault state. So if somebody's cheating on the other, it doesn't really matter. It's not going to give them more money. They're not going to obtain any more child support. That's something that people usually do for their own peace of mind before they go ahead and file for the divorce. Um, but when it comes to you know, actual assets, the amount in a bank account is not disclosed without a court order. So more often than not, private investigators do not have the legal authority to access information such as bank or investment accounts, but a seasoned private investigator may be able to identify the accounts linked to an individual through interviews and public record searches or other legitimate investigative techniques um, that will tie them to specific assets. Um, so again, any accounts that are closed are typically not traceable after those five years. Uh, credit histories and credit checks cannot be run without authorization um, from the client and or permissible use. So if somebody is checking someone's credit history for renting or employment, they sign an authorization and you're able to use that because that's considered permissible use. Um, but just if you want to check your you know, husband's credit without his authorization, you cannot do that. Um, we also, we cannot ping a cell phone without a subpoena. Most likely the courts would be doing that. Um, a lot of people think that we could just trace somebody by their cell phone. That's just not something that, um, you know, we're, we're able to do. Um, there's also a lot of HIPAA laws in place and it does protect us as, you know, just humans, but as an investigator, it restricts us from conducting investigations. We can't get you know, hospital records. We can't find out about anything related to any type of medical history which ends up limiting us. Um, also, we cannot access any information without permissible use at all, since what we uncover is very sensitive information and it can be used to do harm and we would be liable for that. So everything that we do is extremely sensitive. So we have to make sure that it's getting into the right hands. So that's basically it. Um, does anybody have any questions regarding asset searches or investigating in general, or if anyone has any experiences they want to share, personal or professional, positive, negative, related to investigations, we will answer at the end. There's a few questions, uh, Lisa, actually, if I could um, pose them. Uh, somebody asked, um, can you discuss about moving funds or assets offshore? Uh, Mark, I'd like to, uh, if it's okay, oh, Lisa, yeah. pose, a, pose like a hypothetical and how we would address question thank you ronnie for asking that question how we could approach it as a legal matter and then what an investigator would do to approach it okay so Ron, ronnie's question is about what happens when assets are moved offshore or assets are moved around and how would we address that and unfortunately this is an extremely common situation we have many times people coming to us it's almost always the wife almost always the non-money spouse who has had a very nice lifestyle uh, and then suddenly discovers the house is in foreclosure or assets are missing or suddenly there's huge mountains of debt that she is also responsible for. So I'm going to ask Joe, uh, how would you approach that challenge if a client comes to you where their assets are gone? How would you approach that strategically? And then maybe Lisa, what would you do to locate assets if they've gone missing? Someone else also asked, how do you investigate assets? So Joe, that's the hypothetical. Well, it's, it's going to depend. Uh, obviously, it's going to be the same steps that I said on, on locating and tracing through the bank accounts to see what would have happened, um, at least at an onset. If there's a big withdrawal or it shows that a big uh, amount of cash went missing, um, then obviously that's going to be a starting point. If, if it's something that you know th there's nothing to show um, you know, one of the things that, you know, we have to explain to clients all the time is that, you know, where we run into a situation, what Jackie had just explained is that we, we have a lot of situations where clients are living above their means, um, where they are running into debt. And when they're saying, you know, I was able to live this lifestyle. Um, and when you look at the lifestyle and you see what's there, there's no cash going in. Um, and there's just mounds and mounds and mounds of debt. Um, or somebody hasn't been paying taxes for five, six, seven years. 
Um, so when you look through it and they're able to say, you know, we were spending $400,000 a year, we had a $400,000 a year lifestyle, uh, it might show $400,000 a year coming in, um, but zero taxes being paid on that amount. Um, on top of it, they were running up, uh, you know, 50, 60, $70,000 a year in credit card debts. So there might be additional debt paid on top of that. Um, right. So you're really going to have to look into the specifics of, of what the situation is. If you're looking at a situation where the, the income matches it and suddenly there's a bank account that had, you know, two or $3 million in it and it got wiped out and it's sitting at zero and there was just one withdrawal and it got transferred to six different accounts. And then from six different accounts, it went to six different other accounts. And then there was withdrawals from there. And it's just like a string of, we're just chasing everything. Um, you know, oftentimes what the argument will be at that point, um, we'll, we'll look to offset it on something such as the marital residence. Um, where if we know that there were, you know, two and a half million dollars that went missing and, you know, we're able to show that it was taken out by, you know, by the husband or by the wife or by the party um, just prior to the divorce being filed or just after the divorce was being filed. Um, even if we're not necessarily able to follow and show exactly where that money went, we're able to show who took it and who would be responsible for paying that back. Um, so even if we're not able to come up with exactly where that money went through a PI, we would look to attach it to a different asset because everything is lumped together. So if there is that equity in the home or there's additional debt that we could put on to that person. So if they're taking, a, you know, they took an extra, you know, $2 million, well, then they'll have to absorb all that credit card debt that went along with it um, and try to make them as whole as possible on that, or ideally be able to find exactly where that money went. Um, so they're able to get that portion of their cash directly. Yeah, and just adding on to that, in terms of presenting a theory of the case to a judge, we want to show credibility issues of the, the spouse that's maybe acting in a sinister fashion and hiding assets in a very premeditated way. And we also need to prove that by backing up with documents. And as Joe mentioned before, and now we're going to hear from Lisa in a minute, we really approach that almost always with issuing subpoenas. It is our responsibility as attorneys to really cover the ground, look for uh, any accounts in the name of the spouse or in the name of the business. Uh, we need to send out as many subpoenas as possible to make sure we don't miss, any, miss anything. And then these days we get a flash drive of thousands of pages of documents sent over from the bank with a certain chain of custody. So we know it's credible documentation from the bank and we are looking for transfers that seem suspicious. And we need the client sometimes to help us, tell us what looks suspicious because sometimes it's only a few thousand a month and sometimes it's much larger amounts. The same goes for gambling debts. Uh, we sometimes have to subpoena um, casinos. Sometimes we have parties that have the spouse has a substance abuse issue. And so monies are just disappearing to feed a habit. Uh, the good news is when we're talking about money transacted through eBay, PayPal, Amazon, banks, any type of financial institution, including Bitcoin, there is a paper trail. There is a way to find those assets. It just takes time and it takes money. And people wonder why these cases are so costly. We have to gather that information. We have to present it to the court to show that the spouse uh, is a bad actor and is acting in bad faith. The only assets that I think are really truly go missing and it's very hard to really deal with that uh, from a legal standpoint is cash, actual cash and jewelry and stones. And we deal with a lot of jewelry businesses and cash businesses. Those are very tricky, need a very proactive strategy. Uh, and now, uh, Lisa, I'm going to throw it to you. How would you yeah. approach this hypothetical if there are assets missing or offshore? Absolutely. And to add on to what you said and what Joseph said, is, you know, when people are moving assets around, you have to have a starting point. And you usually have that starting point as looking at their bank accounts, their withdrawals, or whatever the client might seem might feel that is being um you know hidden from them and you start with that once you have the starting point it's all about digging and you have to dig in different areas file subpoena after subpoena and some of them you might get hit gold and you might find exactly what you're looking for and some of them might be a waste but it's just about continuing to investigate which again costs a lot of money um and it could not it could be cheaper depending on you know how well it's hidden um but the you know the more stuff the more assets there are the the more money it's going to take to uncover everything and the more that they the, the, the better that they hit everything the harder it is to dig so we have to do database searches we have to contact different banks and 
again, without a subpoena, the banks aren't talking to us about financials. So a lot of it comes down to court orders and judgments um, when you're working with a, you know, a high, high conflict divorce case. Yeah, and, and the courts will allow us to subpoena third parties. So sometimes yes. we'll subpoena the business partner. Sometimes we're subpoenaing the husband's brother or mother. It's not the most fun thing to do, but ultimately sometimes they have the information or assets have been transferred to family members. And if you show the court a basis to ask for this information as part of a legal strategy to protect your client, the courts really do come through. They give you that authority. They give those orders. And then we execute them and hope that we get the information that we need. Again, the sooner we do it, the better. Waiting years and years is almost always going to lead to a disappointing result. No, and absolutely. We, and there's always that paper trail. So once you start digging at one, you find something in one spot and then you're like, oh, wow, here's a different name. And now you start looking at that person's name and you start subpoenaing that person. So it just keeps going and going. And it's just like a long string of people that you might need to speak to. You might need to subpoena. You might need to interview, whatever it may be, to uncover all of that. Yeah, Jose has a question. What is the best way to protect our hard earned assets? And the, the advice I give to everyone, whether you're single, married, divorced or widowed, the best way to protect your assets is to keep your eye on the ball. You have to take a look at your financial statements. You have to take a look at your tax returns and know what they mean. Meet with an accountant or financial professional if you have questions. And uh, it's really those four metrics, income, assets, debts, uh, liabilities and expenses. When you know those categories and you have your eye on them, you're going to protect your assets. And you should, you know, this is not a situation where we're recommending that you should distrust your spouse. You should, um, in a good relationship, trust your spouse. But that doesn't excuse you uh, in protecting your assets because you could have an excellent partner who's very trustworthy, but just isn't good at investments or saving money or really, um, you know, putting you at risk financially. So it really does fall on you. And for any of the women listening, or if you're advising women clients, there no longer is that this attitude that women need to be dependent and protected. That innocent spouse rule, you know, is sort of out the window. Women are charged with being earners, charged with understanding what their joint tax returns mean when they sign them. And they're not protected in the same way it's really on you. That's a great question, Jose. We have another question from Jeffrey. Right now with, um, with, he's asking uh, about I thought it was yeah, I've seen a lot of women actually filing uh, prenuptial agreements lately um, to protect their, their their assets. You know, um, it used to be where only men filed, and now we see a lot of women are filing as well. Yeah, prenuptial agreements. We are seeing a boom in them. I know there are other matrimonial lawyers that are participating today. I think we would all agree that prenuptial agreements, postnuptial agreements, are probably the best way to protect uh, property and income and to do it in a way that's proactive when people are getting along and actually like each other and want to be fair with yes. one another. That's really why prenuptial agreements are the way to go as opposed to uh, trying to fight it out later on when trust and communication are breaking down. Um, there's a question from Jeffrey and I, I wanna make sure I understand it properly. Uh, he's saying um, the allocation of the value of premarital assets uh, typically applied to business or real estate. How does this situation come up and how does it play out? And that question, Jeffrey, goes right into uh, what Lisa just mentioned about prenuptial agreements. To the extent that you can protect pre premarital assets, whether it's real estate or a business, acknowledge that it's separate property, have those assets appraised, even without a prenup, at least have some evidence of value of those assets before the marriage, because that's going to be the best way to shield it from being commingled or being um, claimed as partly a marital asset. And when you're talking about real estate that can be done with an appraisal, you have to be very careful with adding a spouse's name to title on an asset, whether it's real estate or whether it's a business, even without having the spouse's name on title, it still can be subject to a claim as a marital asset. These are definitely things that would work best if you're open and honest with a partner before you get married, hopefully have some understanding about sharing premarital assets and sometimes you have spouses that are very involved with growing the value. 
of a medical practice or a real estate venture or a business. And in those cases, same thing with intellectual property. If you have a spouse that's really part of growing the asset or uh, you know, um, sharing uh, expenses with a, with, a, with a party that's growing a business, that is something that is going to be potentially subject to claim in a matrimonial action. And a lot of people would say some of that is fair. And just, uh, I think part of what your question was on that is that you really need three pricing points um, if you're going to litigate those, those issues and the court requires those three pricing points. So you're gonna need, especially if you're starting out, um, it's why it's very important at a prenup to have a value assigned to whatever that real estate or business is because you're going to need that initial pricing point. If you don't have that initial pricing point when you're going to litigate a case and you're arguing um, that due to your contribution, you increase the value of the real estate or you increase the value of the business, the court needs a starting point to go on to say, this is what it was worth when you got married and here's how much it is worth today. So we know what the increase is that can be contributed to the other spouse. Without that initial pricing point, you're kind of out of luck. Um, and usually they'll ask for three pricing points. They'll ask for one um, at the start of the marriage. They'll look for another one, usually at the date of filing or as close to the date as commencement as possible. And then another at the date of the actual trial date to show what the increase in value is and what that other you know, contributing spouse uh, that contributed to the business or the real estate would be entitled to. Um, oftentimes that we run into that situation, we, you know, you wind up either, you know, uh, depending on who you represent, if you don't have that initial value, it, it's nearly impossible to prove what the increase was. And the court isn't going to speculate and just say, well, over the course of 30 years, it, it, I'm sure it increased by X amount of dollars. They're going to want a hard number and evaluation to go on based on that. Yeah, that's a great point. And because so much of the audience today is real estate professionals, I think that's really important for people to understand in family law, especially because the market is really booming out here on Long Island and in the city in many areas. Uh, you know, real estate is not something that stays fixed in value as of the time the divorce starts. It is something that is really the value changes based on market forces. And that can you know, really swing widely one way or the other, depending on what year we're talking about. And so that is something that people need to be aware of, uh, especially if they separate and only one party is paying the mortgage. Sometimes there's unrealistic expectations about how much of that asset is really shared um, years down the road when it's time for trial. And, and courts protect parties by getting updated appraisals. It's very important to have comps that are reliable. And we're about to see probably a lot of foreclosures in the system, which are going to really tamp down valuations in certain areas. So it's very important that when we're looking at appraisals and valuations, we're really looking at the right criteria to make sure that we're, we're using a fair number for fair market value. Uh, when it's separate property, everything Joe said is very important. You need to make sure you have reliable appraisals as of the date of the marriage. Sometimes parties only have bank appraisals because they're refinanced or they want to look. Those are not the right uh, numbers. Those are sometimes really low. So these are all reasons why people, if they have questions in this area, should consult with a family law attorney. Most of us offer free consultations. Most of the consultations are virtual. And so it really isn't hard to speak to a few different professionals and, and get answers in case you have a question. Um, there's one other question, Mark, I'm not sure if you saw it from uh, Ronnie. She asked again about offshore accounts, uh, bank accounts and subpoenaing them. The fact is you can't subpoena a bank outside New York unless it has a local branch, right, Joe? That's really kind of a dead end, yes. when it, right? Or Lisa? Yes. Yeah. Right. So we can still trace the funds. We can still show that it started in New York, uh, whether we can really show where the money went after that. Sometimes it's just raising uh, a question for the court, showing the court that there's something happened to this money and, and then throws the burden over to the other side to explain what did you do with the money? Where did the money go? It really comes down to who controls the, the account, who, tr who controls the asset. Uh, so again, sometimes we raise questions. We can't always answer them with documents. If assets have already left the country, we all know that it's very easy to shield money in offshore accounts. Uh, and there are jurisdictions that are set up that way for that exact purpose. So it's definitely tricky. Let me see, are there any other questions? Ronnie has some great questions. <laughs> um, 
So it says, uh, maybe Joe, you can answer this with a judgment. Can someone hire an attorney in a participating painting country? So I guess that goes to full faith and credit. If we have a money judgment or we have a court order from New York, what can we do to execute it in another country? Yeah, if, if that country is, is uh, participating and we have, um, you know, if they're, you're able to hire another, uh, another attorney in another country to record a judgment, a foreign judgment, whether it's in New York or it's out of the country, those, th those are things that are able to be done. Um, if somebody comes to us with a judgment they obtained out of state, we're able to record that in the county where the property is located and have it attached to the property. Uh, you can hire an attorney, whether, you know, if you get a judgment in New York, that judgment is valid, um, you know, wherever else it may be, um, where you can have something like that recorded. So yes, you can hire another attorney in a participating country or county to file whatever judgment you obtain here in that country. Yeah, we, we get a lot of inter interstate and international inquiries. Uh, so we can definitely provide some direction on that. There was a question here from Michelle uh, to Lisa. Lisa, can you please mention the specific types of assets which a national assets search reveals? Yeah, absolutely. So um, the nationwide asset searches, they look for the um, banks and brokerage and property information. So like the cars, the companies, the real estate, any hidden assets, money, um, planes, trust accounts, judgments, liens, um, just the basic overview of where all of your money has been going for most of your life. Very good. All right, we're at 12 o'clock, Mark. Are there any last questions? Hopefully we answered everything. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I have a two week old at home. <laughs> My bed yeah, is Lisa, Lisa that, gets an excuse. Lisa has a two week old. So uh, the fact Lisa yeah, is able to devote an hour of her time and attention, we greatly appreciate that, Lisa. Thank you. So, um, I would like to give a testimonial for Lisa, if that's okay. I recently yeah. worked with Lisa. First of all, congratulations on the baby. Thank you. Um, you know, she's very responsive. And I think all of us as professionals here, whether you're an attorney or an investigator or a real estate professional or accountant, the, the name of the game for clients that need um, professional help, besides just the expertise of the professional, is whether that person is responsive. I want to personally attest that Lisa is extremely responsive. Uh, and sometimes in emergency matters, when clients are really looking for answers, and uh, I really appreciate that, Lisa. And I want to thank you for being part of this presentation today. It was really great. We learned a lot. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. One last question, actually. Does the nationwide asset search include electronic accounts like Venmo or Cash App? No, so Venmo and Cash App, they are all private. Same with like cell phones, like fake phone numbers. You can never right. trace those. But the thing is, is when you're getting, when you transfer the money from your Venmo account into your regular bank account, when your bank account statements are pulled, it's showing that you're getting money out of Venmo. So you can kind of work backwards from there. Excellent. That's true. Um, well, we want to thank Jackie, Joseph, and Lisa for taking the time and really kind of, uh, you know, going through a lot of stuff quickly. Um, obviously, there's a lot more to dig down with respect to this, but this is a really good overview on this topic. Um, and hopefully we'll uh, have them back and you'll get an email. You just need to sign that and send that back to Michelle Wu uh, in order to get your credit. And again, thanks, Lisa, Joseph, Jackie. And uh, we look forward to, and most importantly, actually, as I always say, make sure you take their number because uh, if you have a matrimonial matter or a matter, you know, uh, a prenup or something, you know, that's in their uh, area of specialty, as you can see, they are well-versed and excellent at what they do. Uh, so please reach out to Joseph and Jackie or Lisa or all three. So thanks again. Thank you, Thank you very much, everyone. Have a great day. Bye-bye. All right. Well, hope to see you soon. Thanks.